suspense. For suspense, tonight we present Menace in Wax by John Dixon Carr. During the French Revolution of 1793, a Swiss girl copied in wax the severed heads of those who had just been guillotined. She married a Frenchman named Toussaint and came to London, and she founded Madame Toussaint's Waxworks. There it is, still in Marylebone Road, near Baker Street Station. Not the original building. That was destroyed by fire. But it remained untouched when a darker shadow than revolution came to England. And they plastered high explosives all along that road and hit the cinema next door. We are going to London under the bomber's moon. Late one night in March of 1941, a young man hurried up to the great glass doors of Madame Toussaint. Hey, open up here. Isn't there a night watchman around this place? There is, Governor, and I'm him. Now, what do you want at this hour of the night? My name is Rogers. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh. If you let me get inside, I'll show you my press card. Didn't you get any orders about me? Well, maybe I have at that. Oh, you're the bloke who wants to see the Chamber of Horrors. That's right. <laughs> All right, you may as well come in. My paper got a tip. There's something funny going on around here. Something funny going on here? Yeah, that's a good one. The raid's not very heavy tonight, is it? No, they're going over. You ain't heard where, Governor. We got a teletype flash. There was the Midlands. Lord Lummy, and I've got a sister in Birmingham. Oh, why can't she come and stop in a nice, safe place like London? There's the Regent Park guns opening up again. My teeth rattle and shakes the hats off the dummies' heads. You know, this chamber of ours is getting to be popular tonight. You mean there's been somebody here before me? Yes. A woman? That's right, Governor. About five feet, two inches tall, very pretty. If you like them, brunette and big-eyed and a phony French accent. No, Governor, no. This was only an old lady that lost her handbag. Oh, thank the Lord for that anyway. Now then, what is going on around here? Well, I don't know, Governor. You'll have to ask Pearson about that. Who's Pearson? Oh, he's the bloke that's the watchman down there. He's old and he imagined things. He phoned your piper. <laughs> have you got an electric torch? Yes. Then go straight on through the marble hall and down the stairs on your left. And don't speak to the policeman, because he's wax. <laughs> yes, that's the way, Governor. That's the way to the Chamber of Horrors. Thank you. Pearson. Hello, Pearson. Pearson. Yes, sir. Huh? You're looking for me. Oh, uh, gee, I didn't see you there. I must have thought you were one of these wax dummies. Uh, ugly dim light, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Rogers is my name. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh, yes. I'm glad you came over. I phoned your paper myself. Maybe I'm just imagining things, but... Uh... Oh, I don't blame you. This place would make anybody nervous, especially during an air raid. Uh, well, sir, it's all right as long as you don't get to imagine they're watching you. Oh, and do you? Oh, yes. Sometimes. That's the gambling group in the center there. Uh-huh. What's that thing over there? That's the famous guillotine. Oh, wait a minute, old boy. You're not trying to tell me that's the original guillotine. No, uh, that was burnt in the fire. Madame Toussaint bought it from Sanson, the executioner. Let me tell you something, Mr. Rogers. What? Years ago... This is straight. 
a young French woman came in here. There was nobody else in the place. She thought it would be great fun to say she'd put her neck in the same guillotine as Marie Antoinette. So she climbed up on that platform. She snapped the little wooden collar down round her neck, shutting herself in. All of a sudden, she realized she didn't know which spring controlled the collar and which spring controlled the knife. Oh, good Lord, she didn't. No. But they say she went crazy. They say she screamed and screamed. What's that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, but... Sweet mama, I'm so scared myself, I cannot help it. Susie. Oh, no, 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 not Susie. Susie, you make it so it rhyme with floozy. That is not nice. Why, you little devil. I ought to turn you across my knee. What are you doing here? And will you forget that French accent? You're driving me crazy. Uh, you know this young lady, sir? Do I? She works for my paper. She's haunting me. Oh, Bert, that's not nice. I like the way I talk. I only try to give you ideas. That's just what I mean. Now, take your arms from around my neck. Uh, she's French, sir. Her mother came from New York, like I did. She's got some funny ideas, accents, and disguises. So, I dress up as an old lady, and I come along, too. That is clever, no? Definitely no. But I go into what I think is the lady's room, and there is Jack the Ripper. I'm so scared, I almost kick the ghost. Whatever else you do, miss, for the love of heaven, put out that cigarette. It is not permitted? It is what they are most afraid of in this place. Fire. If you vouch for this young lady, Mr. Rogers... I don't vouch for anybody. But go on now. What's all the mystery here at Madame Tussauds? You see the group over there? It's called the Gamblers. That three men and a woman in 18th century costumes sitting around a table playing cards? Yes. And about once a week, when the lights are out... Yes? Those dummies do play cards. Is this a publicity trick of some kind? Oh, no, sir. Then what's the game? I'm not crazy. I know they don't actually do it, sir. What I want to know is who changes the cards round in their hands and why? Well, could anybody, anybody from the outside, I mean, get in to change the cards? Oh, yes. There's a back door. But why would anyone want to break in here just to change those cards around? Mon cher Ben, écoutez, listen. I have made a discovery. Listen, if you're going to talk, speak English. Or better yet, just keep still. But I have made a discovery. This card game... What about it? It is crooked. Here is a man which has two deuces of hearts in the same hand. Listen, Susie, I don't give a... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's have a look at those cards. I give you ideas, yes? Susie, for once you're right. And look here. Two of these players have all the clubs and hearts. The other two have all the diamonds and spades. Susie, how many letters in the alphabet? Twenty-six, no? And twice twenty-six is... Fifty-two. The number of cards in a pack. Give me a pencil, Susie, quick. The War Office, Whitehall. MI5, Headquarters of Military Intelligence. There next morning in the map room, used as an office by Colonel Warrender. Mr. Rogers, I'm a busy man. I, I... appreciate that, Colonel Warrender. Well, anyhow, sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, what's all this? These cards you claim form a code, is that it? Yes, sir. Now, look, sir. Let each letter of the alphabet represent a card in clubs and hearts. That's 26. And then? And then when you get to the middle of the message, switch the alphabet over to diamonds and spades. Then you won't keep on repeating. Now, will you read what I've got written on this piece of paper? Jack of diamonds, Q. Three of clubs, F. Well, that doesn't seem to mean much. Oh, never mind the cards, Colonel. Just read the letters. Q, F, A, C, T, O, R, Y. Yes, sir. Q factory. Go on. Uh, oh, just a moment. What is that infernal noise? Johnson Burroughs. Uh, don't bother what? with that, sir. Just read the message, please. Oh. Q factory. 10 p.m., 15th. Today's the 15th of March, Colonel. Uh, all preparations made. Use dive bombers. I see. Uh, this message was left openly. So openly that nobody ever noticed it. Yes, the trick's been tried before. No contacts, no gatherings, no letters that might be intercepted. 
A whole spy ring could walk through that wax museum and read the message without being seen. You and newspaper men trying to teach me my job? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I only... No, no, go on. Well, don't you see? Three or four little boats with portable wireless sets go down the Thames estuary. When they're beyond pursuit, they send that message by radio. Somebody listens. And it's no secret in Fleet Street, sir, that Q Factory is out in the wilds of Glebeshire. Uh, it's no secret anywhere. And that we're making the Shaftesbury bomber out there. So tonight... Unless we do something about it, they're coming over and bomb Q Factory to blazes. Uh, that's impossible. Why? Or can't you tell me? I can tell you this much. Yes, sir. Q Factory is so well hidden that even our own pilots can't fight it from the air. That's one objection to this message. Any other objection? Yes, this talk about dive bombers. Dive bombers in a night attack? What's the good of a dive bomber if he can't see its objective? Well, suppose somebody showed a light. He'd be shot dead as soon as he showed it. Every inch of country for a quarter of a mile round the factory. A quarter of a mile, Mr. Rogers, is patrolled day and night. Well, just the same. They're going to have a try at it, sir. How? I don't know how. Then if you'll excuse me, Mr. Rogers... Well, listen, I... Colonel Warner. Will you give me a pass to go down there to the factory? Certainly not. No one's permitted to go there except the workers. How is the place defended? There's a night fighter station nearby. And several batteries of four 3.7 guns. Then give me a pass to the fighter station or to the gun post. That's a legitimate newspaper request. Well, I, I might manage a pass to one of the gun posts here. Then you'll do it. Well, what on earth is that infernal row? It sounds like somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. Yes, as a matter of fact, Colonel, it is somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. A young lady, so-called. A young lady? Who locked her up? I did. And just what the devil do you mean, sir, locking up people in coat cupboards in the war office? Well, she's a bit excitable, Colonel. I, I thought that uh, she'd better not see you. Oh, thanks for the consideration. Uh, there's just one other favor I'd like to ask. As well? If she asks you for a pass, don't give it to her. Don't give it to her under any circumstances. Uh, what's her name? Susie Dubois. <laughs> You're rather too late for that, young man. Uh, the public relations office granted her a pass two hours ago. What? Oh. A woman to an anti-aircraft battery? Uh, this is what we call a mixed battery. Women on the guns as well as men. She said it would make a good human interest story for the press. I, mm. I must say, I agree with her. Uh, well, one moment, Mr. Rogers, before you go. Yes, sir. That gun post is fully two miles from the factory. You can go there, but if you take one step further, you'll be shot on sight by our guards. I warn you. I'll be careful, Colonel. I'll be careful. Somewhere in the West Country, a yellow moon shines over bare trees. A white mist moving clings to the ground. Susie, are you sure we're on the right road? Ah, uh, mon cher, they have taken away all the signposts in case there is an invasion. I know that. But I follow the map. The map cannot be wrong. We've been driving for hours. Must be... Yes, it is. Nearly half past nine. Half an hour to go. Trees, trees, and still more trees. Look. There's a break in the trees ahead. It will be open country in a minute. Yeah. That's funny. Look how deep the leaves are here on the road. But one thing I tell you, just between you and me and the bedposts, Gate post, Susie. The term is between you and me and the gate post. And speak English. I am speaking English very well, thank you. I do not need your help to be pure. All right, all right. Now, this map. Well, what about it? It say we should go through a lot of villages. Mitford, Archardeen, and Saffron Weville. I have not seen any villages. Did you say Mitford? Oui, monsieur. Susie, let me have a look at that map. Come on, come on, hand it over. But what is wrong? It is a perfectly good map. Yes, Susie. It's a fine map. It's an excellent map. Only it's a map of the wrong county. I have made a mistake. No? I don't even believe you can read. This is a map of Barsetshire. We should be somewhere in Glebeshire. Now, where in the devil are we? We're at the entrance to some kind of clearing with leaves. Oh. Hello there. What was that? Hello there. Somebody calling us. And if we're in Forbidden Area... I see him now. Where? Behind us. He came out of a white cottage back there. He's a big, heavy man. With a mustache. Never mind the mustache. He's wearing some kind of a uniform and he's got a rifle. You think he plugged us? No. I think it is not unlikely. 
Get out those war office passes of ours. Quick. Good evening, my friends. Herc. Good evening. Can you tell me... No, we don't mean any harm. Uh, oh, 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 Can what? you tell me what time it is? Oh. <laughs> what time it is? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, 28 and a half minutes past nine. Thank you. I will keep you covered while I set my watch. Yeah. My next question is, would you like me to shoot you both? No. Listen, Mr. Uh, Mr. McAllister. Captain. Captain McAllister. That's that right? right. Well, Captain, uh, this girl, uh, she's been reading the wrong map. You see, we don't even know where we are. You're in Hollywood Forest, my friend. Hollywood Forest? Is that good or bad? And you don't know what's just beyond the edge of this clearing? No. There's a big open space of a quarter of a mile. In the middle of that open space... Q Factory. We're right on top of it. Then you have heard of Q Factory, my friend. Captain McAllister, we're from the war office, and we've got passes to prove it. Let's see the passes. We were trying to find gun site number... Uh, I've forgotten the number, but it's here on that card. You've passed the gun site. Two miles back up the road. All right. Here are your passes. What are you going to do to us? Uh, I'm not in the regular army. You can thank your stars I'm not. I'm forestry preservation. Oh. You are not going to chuck us in the cooler, even? <laughs> no. Now turn that car on, get back along this road as fast as you can. If they fire at you, as they probably will... Oh, I wish I am home. Pray no, Mao, I wish I am home. Well, then hope for the best. My watch had stopped and you did me a good turn. Now hurry along. Hurry. Sight of heavy ACAC battery. Four 3.7 guns against a moon growing clear white. White as the concrete emplacements. Sealed against light where the crews, men and women, sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, sir, uh, glad to have you both here. But this idea of yours about dive bombers attacking a blacked out factory in the uh, middle of a forest is uh, rather fantastic, don't you think? Well, I admit it doesn't make much sense, Captain Bronson, but I have a hunch that I'm right. Well, glad you and Miss Susie drove out. Don't see many strangers. Frightfully boring. Nice country, of course. Good air and everything, but dull. Dull as ditch water. What's that? Only some of the lads and lasses inside. Like to uh, walk along the emplacement here? Oh, is that allowed? Oh, certainly, old boy. Why not? Bright moon tonight, isn't it? Yes, bomber's moon. We, uh... We nearly get shot on our way here. Quiet, Susan. We're not supposed to have been there. If I nearly get shot, I am going to say I nearly get shot. It was a man which is called, uh, uh McAllister. Oh, old Mac. Uh, very decent sort, Mac. He's a, a tree doctor. A what? Tree doctor. Got to have wood, you know. But trees start to die. Mac goes round the edge of the clearing and smears him with stuff to keep him well. Uh, how did you come to meet him? Well, the fact is, uh... We nearly got as far as the factory tonight. Oh, then you were lucky to get back alive. There weren't any barrage balloons over the factory, I noticed. Well, hardly, old boy. They wouldn't advertise, would they? With balloons in open country? And if the Germans did use dive bombers? Oh, they're not coming, old boy. Just make up your mind to that. I wonder if you'll say so at 10 o'clock. But it is 10 o'clock. It's, uh, well, it's just 10 now. Well, it can't be. We drove here like blazes. It was only half past nine then. Well, then your watch must be very slow, old boy. No, I'm afraid you're wrong. I've never seen it quieter. Cold tonight, very dry for March. Look all around you. Moonlight, open country, not a sign of life in it. Quiet, peaceful, and silent as the great. What was that? By George, I think we've got some visitors. I think we're going to see some fun. Enemy planes approaching south southwest. Action stations. Enemy planes approaching south southwest. Now, do you believe me? Better stand back, old boy. Operation crew's coming on. I said, now do you believe me? I want you to watch these girls work. They do everything, you know, except actually fire the guns. Now, 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 keep your hair on, old boy. Susie, he still can't see it. Oh, they'll only be going over. 
You think so? Oh, yes. We sometimes get a crack at them when they're making for Bristol. Standing by, for action. Standing by. Listen. Listen. Yes, Captain. Captain. I've heard that noise a thousand times. But every time I hear it, I get sick. Mm -hmm. They're flying ruddy low, you know. Just what I was thinking. Spotter! Spotter! Any identification? Yonkers, 88. Dive bombers. Height, 5,200. Now, look here, you two newspaper people. Yes, sir? There might be things popping, you know, can't tell. I'd like to get below. Oh, no, thanks. I don't like this, Bert, but I'll stay, too. Range finder. Range finder. On target. Look here, you two. The, uh, those war office passes you gave me, uh, I'm not supposed to keep them. Now, I'd better give them back, just in case. Predictor. Predictor. On target. Here we go, ladies and gents. Fire. <laughs> Headquarters message, sir. Fire. Yes, Corporal. Hold fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Message understood. What is the matter with them? With who? Those barsh planes. They're still a good way off, but they don't come any closer. Hmm. Must be going over after all. They're circling. I think they're waiting for a signal. Anyhow, here are your war office passes. You... Well, you seem to have got them all smeared with oil. Oil? That is all right, Monsieur. When we get them back from Captain McAllister, they have oil on them. I think maybe he dropped them on the leaves, because there's oil on the tires of the car, too. Then I think how always in this we meet things that burn. At Madame Tussauds last night, they would not let me smoke a cigarette in case of fire. Fire? That set fire. What's the matter with you, old boy? Why did that fella, way out at the end of nowhere, want to know what time it was? Are you scatty? McAllister, you told me so yourself. He goes around the edges of the clearing and smears the trees with stuff to keep them well. Well, what about it? Suppose it was crude oil. Suppose between each tree he laid an invisible fuse of dead leaves soaked in oil. I, uh, I don't understand. In 30 seconds, a complete square of fire runs around the limits of the factory grounds. That draws the bombers in. Then as the flames blaze higher, they've got enough light to dive on their target. There. Our night fighters are letting loose. Brunson, I see it all now. Come on. We've got to get to that tree, Dr. McAllister. It's a matter of minutes. Susie, is Brunson following in the car behind us? Yes. He's following and men with rifles. We've got to get to McAllister's cottage. This McAllister... I'll bet you ten to one. The real McAllister is either dead or tied up in that cottage. The fellow we saw was an imposter. Look out, Susie. Keep your head down. Oh, those fighters. They will chew up every younger in the place. They have not got the chance of a snowshoe in him. No, Susie, not a snowshoe in heaven. You mean a... I know you are English at a time like this. What I cannot understand... Look out! Don't see why he hasn't set his signal off. What is delaying him? Why don't he strike a match when the bombers come over? Because he's a good Nazi. A good Nazi? My watch was slow, don't you remember? And I gave him the wrong time. He had orders to strike his match at 10 o'clock, and he'll not do it until 10 o'clock if there are 500 planes instead of 20. Bert, I see him. Where? Far up the road. He's running. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Think we can reach him before he gets to the clearing? Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. Signal Brunson to pass us. A long shot with a Bert, rifle might... Bert, one of the Yonkers is hit. Huh? He's right over us. That's not all. He's unloading his bombs. The whole stick's coming straight down our direction. Keep your head down. Oh, I'm Put your arms over your face. I don't feel her. This is a dirt road. The bomb sank too deeply before it exploded. We didn't catch the blast. 
Come on, Susie. McAllister was just ahead of us. Come on, let's get out. We can't drive any farther. This road is full of bomb craters. Wait a minute, Susie. There's McAllister. He... He is dead. Yes, Susie. Killed by a Nazi bomb. Look, on the ground. What are those two white cards? Oh. <laughs> They're all smeared with oil. They must have fallen out of McAllister's pocket just before he got hit. Let's see. <laughs> what do you know? What are the cards, Bert? Two tickets for Madame Tussaud's waxworks. I'm afraid our friend's never going to get to use them. Uh-huh. Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. So ends Menace in Wax. Tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these stories of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer. John Dietz, the director. Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor. John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. Here is a message of vital importance to every person who drives an automobile in America. There is wide misunderstanding about gasoline and rubber, and the government wants the following facts brought to everyone's attention. Actually, there is no scarcity of gasoline except in some parts of the East. But nowhere in the country is there enough rubber for military and civilian use. Starting two weeks from today, December 1st, mileage rationing goes into effect. This means that no car owner anywhere in the United States will be able to buy gasoline without a mileage rationing book. The purpose is to conserve the rubber we have by eliminating all unnecessary driving. When we think of the tremendous distances our mechanized army is traveling in North Africa and the long road to victory that still lies ahead, this extra effort on our part is slight indeed. Remember, everybody is going to have mileage rationing, so why not be prepared? The best way each of us can save rubber is by sharing our car with others. Let one car do the work for two or three. So why not arrange with the neighbors tonight and start sharing the car tomorrow? It's the one real important contribution that every automobile driver can make. Don't be a lone rider. Share your car and do your share for victory. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.